It ain't the left side or the right side. Then it must be the fin side. Thank you, Solo D. Welcome to another episode of On the Fin Side here with Kat and Paul. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Spreaker, iTunes, YouTube, iHeartRadio, Spotify. I'm Brian Cat NFL. Paul is fanatic underscore pick on Twitter. The two and eight Dolphins travel to Cleveland to play the four and six Browns at First Energy Stadium. The Browns are favored by ten and a half points in this game, the biggest line of the week. Heading into week 12, this figures to be Jarvis Landry's revenge game, a revenge against two. We're not quite sure yet, uh, but the Browns have won two in a row. Recently, a very controversial 21 to seven victory over the Pittsburgh Steelers that brought them to four and six. Paul, when I looked at this matchup with the Dolphins a couple weeks ago and thinking about how bad Miami's offensive line has been this year, I thought, oh, man, Miles Garrett. Larry Ogunjobi, Sheldon Richardson, and former Dolphin Olivier Vernon. But you look at the game now, Miles Garrett and Ogunjobi are suspended, and Olivier, Olivier Vernon doesn't look like he's going to play either. Yeah, Olivier Vernon sure does miss a lot of games, doesn't he? I mean, and this Miles Garrett guy, I haven't heard much of his name this year. Who, who could you possibly be talking about? Uh, now, in all seriousness, I mean, it definitely benefits the Dolphins if you're in favor of winning because one of the big things that, that's cost the Dolphins a lot this year is losing the battle in the trenches and or even when they have a decent game, not being able to sustain it for four quarters. Paul, what was your – you saw the, the hit, obviously, in the fight. Real quick, without getting too bogged down, what was your reaction to the whole incident and the suspensions? I had to watch it about five times with just the absolute holy hell, what am I watching here? I mean, it's the Ogunobi or Ogunjobi or Obi Wan Kenobi suspension, absolutely warranted. I mean, he flew in late and just rocked Mason Rudolph, who, don't get me wrong, Mason Rudolph is an absolute a hole. Everything I see about this MAGA hat wearing kid, absolute a hole. But at the same time, just because you're a jackass, doesn't mean you deserve to get smashed over the head with a football helmet after it's ripped off of your head. There's got to be that line somewhere. I mean, AJ Francis told a story recently about Mike Pouncey and, you know, basically Pouncey had ripped AJ Francis helmet off his head in practice. Uh, AJ earned it. Pouncey cocked his arm back and suddenly went, ah, no, this is still the wrong thing to do and stopped himself. And that's, Somewhere inside, you need to have that switch that basically says, holy hell, I can't do this. And I hate to say it, Miles Garrett had time to rethink his decision before Mason Rudolph got off the ground and tried to charge at him through um, the center there. And he, he didn't rethink it. He, he basically made it worse in that moment. So, yeah, bye, Miles Garrett. Sorry, best player on the Cleveland Browns, in my opinion. And I don't think he should touch a field anytime soon, not just this season. Yeah, my first reaction was that – actually, I'll go to what Pete Prisco from CBS said is, what would have happened if Miles Garrett did that away from the football field? He'd be in jail, and he'd be in jail for years. And, and that that's the way I look at it. Look, I'm an NFL fan first, and I'm a Dolphins fan second. A lot of people that listen to the show are probably in reverse. But, yeah, for – I mean, as far as I was concerned, I mean, I tweeted the next day, I think he's an attempted murderer. And I mean, if you if he had swung angrily like he did and hit him with the crown of his helmet, we we would be talking about somebody who is dead or who is permanently brain damaged. That's not an exaggeration. On the other side of that, Miles Garrett is somebody that we live in a society and we we're in the National Football League here where you have a chance to redeem yourself. My, he's never been, to my knowledge, in trouble before, and this is very out of character for him, other than some late hits and some fines. So, yeah, I don't know about that. I got to jump in there. I mean, if you look back earlier this season, well after the play, he just blasted Delaney Walker in the face. Uh, you know, he, and this, the only one that was arguable was you look at when he ended Trevor Simeon's season with. A, a little bit of a late hit, but there was no pull up in that in that rodeo. I mean, it, he came in came in late and just threw it into overdrive. There's something 
there with this kid. Yeah, it's uh, a lot of it's talent, and a lot of it is definitely something else. I, I think he will be back next year. Um, Larry Ogunjobi, just a bitch move, and Mason Rudolph call, called him that, pushing him from behind. And Mason Rudolph, uh, I would have liked if there was a little bit more in his voice of saying, you know what, I screwed up too. But I, I didn't see anything of that, in which, which kind of, like, look, he did deserve what happened to him, no doubt about it. But there could have been a little bit more, yeah, I should have handled it differently. I shouldn't have tried to pull off the guy's helmet who was trying to tackle me. So, anyway, let's get to the game a little bit more here, Paul, where when I take a look, even before we actually, we have to, before we even get to the game, the Browns and the Dolphins, it's interesting that they're playing here because what's worth bringing up is a lot of the optimists for this rebuild tank, whatever you want to call it, before the year reference the Cleveland Browns a lot, saying that, you know, this, the Dolphins in two years are what uh, are, could be what the Browns are heading into this year, where you got a quarterback who's coming off a uh, season, rookie year, where he, where he threw 27 touchdowns, which Baker Mayfield did last year. They had Nick Chubb at running back, Odell Beckham and Jarvis Landry at wide receiver. On the defensive side of the ball, they had two cornerstones in Miles Garrett and Denzel Ward and should have that as well for 2020. And they made a lot of trades for Olivier Vernon, for Beckham, like I said. And they were also able to sign Sheldon Richardson for a lot of money, too. So what is your take on where the kind of where the Browns are now and where the Dolphins could be in a couple of years? So I think it's a different scenario. It's a similar design, but a vastly different scenario. It's, I mean, you look at the free agents, the Brown side, they, they go out and they sign these guys with these explosive personalities. That's not, they signed a lot of me first guys. And they drafted a few. Baker Mayfield to this day, to me, strikes me as an absolute me first guy. And he's surrounded by me firsts at wide receiver now. And you look at the Dolphins front office. They put character first. I, I hate to say it, but it, it's you look at uh, this past week. I mean, Mark Walton, the second that there was any type of anything and granted it was it was a big anything but even so they literally just punted him out of the building um you know it's it's they're putting character and team first players first and that's huge on top of that chris greer has shown some promise via the draft on his own not with mike tannenbaum in his ear not with adam gase pulling strings chris greer on his own has already shown some talent propensity for the draft you add to that Reggie McKenzie, the guy that found Derek Carr, Gabe Jackson, Khalil Mack. You add to that Marvin Allen, the guy that found Josh Allen and Tremaine Edmonds for the Buffalo Bills. The guy that out in Kansas City found Tyreek Hill, Pat Mahomes, uh, Travis Kelsey. Uh, you know, the, the list goes on. And you've got a talented group around Chris Greer to give him all the input in the world. So. Really, it's, it's, it's a similar blueprint, but a far different scenario. What I like here of what the Dolphins are doing is I, I feel confident that this regime can find depth and they can find role players. I mean, to, to, get, you know, to have John Jenkins and Vince Beagle and Nick Needham playing at the level that they are now, I think, shows that very clearly. You know, when I look at the Browns scenario is I don't think the Browns were ever – I'm not going to say tanking because I hate using that word, but pushing resources to the following year, if I can say that. The, because the, the problem with the Browns, the Browns had no choice. The Browns didn't have anything. Between the years uh, 2011 and 2016, they drafted in those uh, – or in tw uh, 2011 and 2015, in those four years they had eight first-round picks. Zero of them were even capable of starting. Phil Taylor – Trent Richardson, Brandon Whedon, Barkevius Mingo, Justin Gilbert, Johnny Manziel, uh, Danny Shelton, Cameron Irving, Corey Coleman. I mean, it's the, they didn't have a choice. And then from that point, over the last couple of years, yeah, they were able to put a lot of draft picks together. And the, I think the point I'm trying to make is, over the last several years, 
They had a lot of draft picks. They did not hit on every one of them, but they were able to camp, come away with Baker Mayfield, Denzel Ward, Miles Garrett before the whole thing happened. Nick Chubb has over a thousand total, uh, over a thousand rushing yards on the year. So we'd hope the Dolphins can not only make use of those draft picks, but even do a better job than the Browns have. Absolutely. And and the fact that they're able to accelerate that, that timetable a little bit more because they did have some resources to give up to, to get the, the pieces they need in place is absolutely a good thing. And the fact that they held on to some resources and basically took a year to, to, analyze all these players that they they wanted to see something from that you may not be able to take a look at in a normal everyday run-of-the-mill season so yeah i think they're doing it a lot better with their blueprint than the browns did let's take a look at this game paul on the offensive side of the ball ryan fitzpatrick is certainly driving the train here and is what's keeping not only the offense but the team competitive. Since the bye week, 133 passes, or excuse me, he's attempted 201 passes, completed 133 of them, over a 66% completion rate with this group that he's got around him and this offensive line. Seven touchdowns, three interceptions, and a rushing touchdown. So, yeah, the Dolphins aren't a juggernaut on offense, no doubt about that, but I, I like that he's keeping them competitive here in this game. And when you look at the Browns defense for the year against opposing quarterbacks, uh, 205 completions on 340 attempts, just over 60% completion, 16 touchdowns allowed eight or eight interceptions, 87.4 quarterback rating, but four of those interceptions were against Mason Rudolph last week. So they got half of their interceptions for the year last week against Pittsburgh against the run they're allowing 4.66 yards a carry to opposing running backs, which is kind of on the high side, 211 carries, 984 yards, five touchdowns. Uh, Kalen Balazs at running back is obviously just a punchline at this point, 1.9 yards a carry, and which may even be more stunning, 3.8 yards a catch. So, I I mean, I'm not sure where to go with Kalen Balazs, except for for a one-way ticket out of town on a bus, but – how do you see the running backs going here, Paul? Patrick Laird got in at the end, caught six passes for 51 yards. Should we start the game out with him or with anybody but Balage? Honestly, I think the Dolphins kind of locked in on something with Laird last week, and I think we're going to see that continue this week. I think we're going to see Laird come in, get a handful of carries, but, but really be a receiving threat out of the backfield early and often. We're going to see Balazs as much as we don't want to running into, God, whoever ends up playing for the Browns on the D-line since everybody's out. And this might be the one week where Balazs might have a little bit of success because their big starting caliber D-line was allowing over four and a half yards of carry. Their backups are going to come in, and and I can't imagine they're going to be that much better than the starters. It's we know what caliber the starters are that are out, and Ogunobi or Ogunjobi. God, I can't get that one. No, and, nobody can. You know, Miles Garrett and and Olivier Vernon. So, really, this could be the week that Kalen Balaj actually has a decent yard per carry average, like maybe three yards a carry but at least something mildly effective. And, yeah. and that could be just enough to open it up for Laird. I didn't think uh, – I thought Balazs might have had some success last week against Buffalo because their run defense wasn't too good. He, To his credit, or to make an excuse for him, he, he didn't uh, – first, first carry of the game, there's a miscommunication on the offensive line. He's pounded five yards in the backfield. And if that happens again this week, I don't care who you're blocking, it, it's not hard to break – break through against somebody who's not blocking you. So, you know, I, I think from the outset, they need to go shotgun quite a bit to give Fitzpatrick more time to get layered out there in that Danny Woodhead type of role coming out of the backfield. Um, but, yeah, the, the offensive line is not going to have to block Vernon and Garrett. They'll be replaced with uh, journeyman Chris Smith at defensive end, as well as former Miami Hurricane and secular player Chad Thomas, who hasn't 
really been all that good with them. But their third defensive end will be number 94, very interesting name, Brian Cox Jr., the son of Brian Cox. So keep an eye out for him in this game against his dad's old team. But also on the offensive line here, Paul, I mean, Dan Kilgore returns to action a couple weeks ago, forces Evan Bain to center, and we start thinking, you know, the interior of the line may not be too bad for the rest of the year, but then they take a massive step back last week. Oh, they absolutely did. And I mean, it looked like there was a lot of miscommunication early on. I know you alluded to some of that. And really, I'm hoping that they can get back on track with it this week. I know that there's some Dolphin fans that are like, oh, God, we've got to lose out. Otherwise, we might lose out on the quarterback position. And I know there's some people that are upset because of the Tua thing and the fact that there's now rumors that Rosen might actually be their quarterback of the future. At this point, play ball. Let the chips fall how they may. And, and Miami's got the ammunition to do a lot of fun and special things for, for the draft next year. Let's just enjoy the ride as we move forward here because this is the one season where you can say you can really enjoy it whether they win or lose the rest of the way. Yeah, uh, I don't think Rosen will be the future of anything uh, from what I saw this year, but that, that's a subject for another day. Uh, yeah. Wide receiver, Devontae Parker is, should be li- lined up against Greedy Williams this game. A lot of people think it'll be against Denzel Ward. Um, our guest uh, from SI, Pete Smith, in our other segment mentioned that Greedy Williams and Denzel Ward do not flip sides of the field, and Greedy should be lined up against Devontae Parker. So we should see, if as long as he gets time to throw, we should see Devontae Parker uh, get a lot of shots there downfield. On the other side, you can forget about Alan Hearns' this game if, if you haven't already. Uh, he'll be lined up against Denzel Ward, a Pro Bowl cornerback, and uh, I don't see that going very well for, for Hearns. Uh, Jakeem Grant, hopefully he comes back as well. He should be lined up against slot, back, slot cornerback T.J. Carey. That should be a good matchup there too. But, Paul, Devontae Parker – Six games left. He needs 394 yards to get 1,000 for the year. Do you think he's going to do it? Are you talking about Devontae Parker, who has as many touchdowns as Odell Beckham Jr. and Jarvis Landry combined? Uh, Devontae a popular Parker? staff this week. I'm just checking. Uh, the, the one, you know, it, it's, I was tempted to pull out the Kalen Balazs as, as many touchdowns as, as Jarvis Landry does this season, but I figured I, I'd leave that one out there. Um. I think it's it's going to be a good week for Parker here. I, I think every week from here on out is he's got a rapport built up. He's playing with a chip on his shoulder, and it's amazing what a good, solid coaching staff can do for a player like Parker with, with his skills that he's got. Yeah, and credit to Parker for being open to that too because this is somebody we really thought was a lost cause, and hopefully he doesn't slip back into his old ways. So he needs – 66 yards on average per game to get over 1,000 for the year. That would be a great milestone in a year where the Dolphins don't have a lot of stats in their corner. Paul, on the defensive side of the ball, the Browns' offense is a little bit more line up and beat you than the Bills were or the Ravens were, where they had so much of the offense focused around a quarterback that could really break the pocket. So Baker Mayfield overall having a disappointing year, but – Over the last three weeks, five touchdowns, no interceptions. Not a surprise that the Browns have won their last two games, given that here. So, but the the bigger concern is the Dolphins put Bobby McCain and put Rashad Jones on injured reserve at safety. They'll be replaced by Eric Rowe and Stephen Parker. It'll give us great insight as to whether or not these guys can be starting caliber players heading into 2020. But wow, now you look at the rest of the roster, you're going to have Nick Chubb in the backfield with Kareem Hunt, so two Pro Bowl caliber running backs. At wide receiver, you're going to have Jarvis Landry and Odell Beckham. And at tight end, you're probably going to have David Njoku, the former first-round pick, returning to action here too. So not a lot of good matchups uh, for the Dolphins' defensive backs here. Yeah, the one that scares me is the Njoku matchup, if he does return as expected. Um, I know we've talked at length about it. Tight ends still t- seem to be the Dolphins' Achilles' heel. Uh, it's you know you look back at the indie game, we knew that Doyle and Ebron were going to be kind of the big hitters for the indie offense. We you know you look back at the Ravens game, you look back with Mark Andrews. It's Njoku scares me more than Landry and, and, and Odell do. 
Landry's probably going to be so fired up for this game that he's going to do something stupid or get into it with somebody on the sidelines, play me, me, me ball. And that's what I hope he does. I, ho- I hope Landry plays me, me, me ball to keep the ball out of Joku's hands. And, you know, you keep Nick Needham, you keep Eric Rowe keeping an eye out, you keep Ken Crawley keeping an eye out. Nick Rowe talks enough trash that he's going to make Landry lose his damn mind. So let's hope Needham gets out there on, on Landry a little bit. Nick Needham, incredible uh, grades from Pro Football Focus, and they've, they've actually ranked him as one of the best cornerbacks here over the last month in the NFL, not just the Dolphins, but in the NFL. So yeah, it, it's going to be a great test because you're going to have, like you said, at the corner spots you're going to have Nick Needham and Ken Crawley matched up against Odell Beckham and Jarvis Landry. And at the safety spot, Steve Parker and Eric Rowe, two players who I think have a lot – have shown – starting ability here over the last couple of weeks, especially for a team that frankly can't replace 17 starters, no matter how many draft picks or how much money they have for next year. So another matchup to watch too, the Browns, not a very good offensive line, but then again, the Dolphins have arguably the worst pass rush in the league. One interesting matchup to keep an eye on is going to be Vince Beagle against left tackle Greg Robinson. Vince Beagle's had a lot of pressures this year, only two sacks on the year, but always gets heat on the quarterback, overall having a very good year. Greg Robinson has been Greg Robinson this year, so that that's hopefully a matchup the Dolphins can win to get some pressure there on the quarterback. Um, but it, when you look at, at the rest of this here, not very good matchups for the Dolphins' defense, but they will get Raekwon McMillan back at, at middle linebacker, Paul. And thank God for that. I mean, that's going to be huge, uh, give, given the fact that they've got Chubb and Hunt in the backfield. Rake has been absolutely the best run defender. He was completely missed last week. But thank God he is back in this one. Yeah. So the Browns are 10.5-point favorites. Biggest point spread of the week in the NFL. What's your prediction here, Paul? I think the Browns are enough of a mess right now. I think Baker Mayfield's kicking rocks, but I think they still pull this one out. I think Miami drops this one to the Browns 20-17, to 17, even though it hurts me to say it. Yeah, I, I think it's going to be worse than that. Um, when I look at uh, what the, the injuries the Dolphins have now as they're lining up, they, they don't have a defensive back that was anywhere close to anything close to anywhere close to the starting lineup here at the beginning of the year. Granted, these guys have played over their heads too, but I think they're going to be terribly outmatched in this. And I think kind of that we're getting better. We're getting better. We're getting better feeling they've had over the last six weeks has let down a little bit too. I see the Browns winning convincingly. I'm going to go with 34 to 10 in favor of Cleveland. And that would bring the Dolphins to two and nine. And if that were to happen, you look at the draft order. Um, you've got the Bengals at one right now, the Redskins at two, the Giants at three, the Dolphins at four. Then uh, with the three win teams, you've got the Jets at five and the Bucks at six. And the Dolphins can't fall any further than six this week, even if they end up upsetting the Cleveland Browns. So that will do it for our breakdown of the Dolphins Browns matchup heading into this Sunday at First Energy Stadium in Cleveland. You can follow Paul and I on Facebook, Twitter, Spreaker, iTunes, YouTube, iHeartRadio, and Spotify. I'm Brian Cat NFL. Paul is fanatic underscore pick. That's fanatic with a PH. And if it's not on the right side and it's not on the left side, it is on the fin side. Solo D, take us home. It ain't the left side or the right side, and it must be the fin side. It ain't the left side, left side or the right, right side. side, and it must be the fifth left. Listen, Dolphins fans across the land all tuning in to see what we're